Good afternoon. I, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Richard France and Mark Hawley for inviting me uh, to, the, uh, to the celebration of the opening of the Center for Assistive Technology and Connected Healthcare at the University of Sheffield. I'd like to also acknowledge people who I'm sure may well be in the audience, um, including uh, Gail Mountain um, as, as colleagues and friends. As you must have sensed by now, I'm not actually with you. Um, uh, it's a shame, but I uh, injured myself uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm now um, using a wheelchair temporarily um, and in some discomfort. So uh, I have to uh, use this virtual method to, uh, to join you. Richard asked me to make this 30-minute uh, presentation um, in two parts. He wanted me to describe the um, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, its research uh, environment, um, which some of you I think have visited, but uh, uh, many of you haven't yet, although you're very welcome. And then he also wanted me to give a couple of examples of uh, our outcomes, our products, to illustrate um, how we work as a center. I'm going to do this tour much in the way as I would if I were taking you on um, a walk around the center. We, we seem to focus on um, the simulator labs um, because it's the easiest way of showing what we do and what the outcome is. We actually have seven simulators and we're building an eighth at the moment. And I'm going to describe uh, four or five of them and some projects that take place within them. The first is home lab. Now you have a home lab as well, so um, this should not be great news to you. You can see here home lab is a modest uh, income, typical income apartment maybe a house because you can see some stairs going upstairs although upstairs is simply a gallery um, that we can walk around and we can place recording instruments and we can take people and on on tours without interrupting what's going on downstairs you can look in through the <coughs> through the window uh, downstairs and here you can see a researcher studying one of the electronic monitoring systems, one that Alex Mahaladis has been developing that detects if you've fallen and engages in a conversation with you uh, to decide whether you need help. But it does this without having to wear um, a, um, a badge to wear a device because we know that wearing those devices um, is, is a problem. Um, some 70% of people are not wearing them when they actually fall, and only about half of those who fall can operate them. From inside the living room, I, I took a photograph the other day um, showing the scene today through past a, a little home robot on the right, through the door into the bedroom, and through the door into the bathroom. And let's take a peek into each of those rooms quickly. In the bedroom, uh, you see a couple of our um, projects on display. The first one is built on this uh, old technology. We, 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 we were the first people, oh, I think as a te research team 20 or 30 years ago, 30 years ago, to develop a commercial version of um, a safety pole, which compress, held its place held itself in place by compressing between the floor and the ceiling. But I always wanted, let's let this film play, I always wanted to be able to um, use it as a kind of um, a Lego kit so that someone could come home, we could clip together parts quickly. This is not actually how the commercial version looks, but this is how the commercial version does look. Um, uh, clip them together so that when someone comes home without any fuss and bother one could quickly go out um, 
buy this product, by the way, in a box only a meter long, put it in the car, take it home, uh, assemble it essentially without tools, without having to drill into the walls or anything, and arrange um, uh, handrails to go, for example, from the bed around into the um, toilet in the bathroom. As needs changed, one could reconfigure this Lego kit um, quickly um, into, for example, an exercise parallel bar system. I'm pleased to tell you that this is almost on the market. It's in its final trials at the moment. One feature of it is that the shorter segments that are used between poles are also gates, so that you do not have to do the limbo when um, vacuuming or working around the house. Now, the bathroom is dear to my heart. It's, um, if you can't manage, as you know, in the bathroom when you go home, the chances are you'll end up in a nursing home. It's a source of a lot of difficulty. And one of the things about Canadian bathrooms and British bathrooms, actually, is that they're very small. Um, and that may be appropriate at younger points in life, but as we get older, um, the bathroom becomes very important. And that... Uh, the, the size becomes a problem. Here you see a scene w which is rather typical of a Canadian bathroom, at least, where the toilet is sort of hidden around behind the vanity, between the vanity and the tub. Well, you imagine, you imagine that um, your mother or father or um, um, who knows how old you are in the audience, your grandfather, have come home and you're assigned at home to get them up in the morning to get them on the toilet, to lift them off the toilet, wipe their bum, what, bathe them and dress them and get them moving. And you can see why there is an extraordinary level of uh, injury experienced by home care workers, um, quite, quite, quite beyond uh, anything that's seen in any other industry. And part of the reason is if you were to try and squeeze around that toilet and get yourself into a good position to do the lifting, you, you, you couldn't. The same, look at the person there um, trying to bathe the feet, bending over to lift the feet in and out of the tub, bending over to bathe them, but with one hand in case they slip. Um, it's a disaster area. Um, so a lot of new technologies, I'm not going to describe the devices, I don't have device time to describe them in all of these labs, um, but we're developing a lot of technologies and have brought to market technologies that help um, with these processes at home. Let's move on to the second simulator. Let's move on to Care Lab. Care Lab, as you see, is a typical hospital room or nursing home room. Um, by Canadian standards, um, it's a little bit small. Um, we've done that deliberately to challenge us because technologies um, can be terrific help but mechanical technologies, at least, can occupy space at times, and you can, you can find them to be a real nuisance to get in the way. So we want to exaggerate that effect. And we're also preparing technologies for use in other areas of the world where space is tighter. Now, I'm going to show you one example of a technology that matches, fits with the the Lego pole system, which will eventually be called the kit, by the way. And here's its equivalent in, um, in, a, um, in an institution. You'll appreciate that um, we dread um, sending elderly people into acute care hospitals because often they come back um, in a worse condition than they went in. Um, they're left lying in bed for lengthy periods of time. They lose the ability to walk. They lose the ability to be continent. And they become disoriented. It's really important to help them get up and out of bed. And it would be lovely to be able to use those Lego poles, but you can't because the ceiling is a suspended ceiling. And if you squeeze between the floor and the ceiling, you just raise the ceiling. So here's a product called Stand Easy, which is now just on the market. Um, and it can and it works by attaching tracks to the ceiling uh, to the wall I beg your pardon that's the whole point of it attracting uh, attaching tracks to the wall that you can then attract stand attach stand easy to um, when needed and it provides a really firm position 
to help you stand up and go off around the room. Now I'm advancing to another project in Care Lab run by one of my graduate students who's now a scientist with us, now leader of the technology team, Tilak Dutta. And here you see him studying how to maneuver, how to lift people around. Again, lifting is a huge problem, and especially with heavy people. Um, we're now dealing with bariatric people. But one of the problems that's common to all lifting is that although you can use overhead lifts to good effect, you've got to get something under the person before you can lift them. And Tillak discovered that that, in fact, is an injurious activity, even with rolling to and fro. So we came up with this idea. Emily King was a key player in this. Um, and here it is. It's called Sling Serta. Again, it's about to hit the market very shortly. It's done extensive trials. And it's the first device that we know of that introduces a sling under you, whatever your weight, completely effortlessly. Um, we basically squirt it under you um, using air. It advances under the body without creating any friction by uh, rather like rolling your sock off. There are, it's rather like two caterpillar tracks that carry a, a strap through the middle. When you want to remove it, you just pull on the strap and you can see with no effort and no friction, it in turns inside out and comes out. Now obviously, you'd inject several of these under a person. And here you can see I think it's Emily doing the injection. Um, and um, once you've injected them under, oh, it's Susan doing it. Once you've injected them under, you connect them to a frame. Um, and if they were 350 or 500 pounds, just one person's involved in this process, no stress, chatting to the patient, you can then lift the patient maybe just one or two inches. I wouldn't lift them more with just these three straps. Um, we would lift them one or two inches, put a full sling under them, reconnect them, and then lift them so they don't fall through the straps. But for many activities, this is good enough. For example, if there's a need to change the bed, one can rapidly change the bed, um, quickly insert new um, bedding and lower them, or in this case, she's inserting a sling to lift them off the bed to somewhere else. Okay, let's advance from that. And there you see um, me playing around lifting three people at once. There doesn't seem to be a limit on how much we can lift. Um, let's go to simulator number five. We're going to skip a couple of simulators and we're going to go to Stair Lab. <coughs> and um, this is a view of Stair Lab on top of our motion base. And here you see someone coming down the stairs and at a moment in time their balance is disturbed and we see how they rescue themselves um, using the handrail. These experiments uh, sometimes uh, don't require a motion base, sometimes they're simpler experiments. Um, here we're doing some work on the run or the going you call it in the UK. Um, the going, um, adjusting the going of stairs of given riser height to study the biomechanics of the safety of stairs in order to change the Canada Building Code. Um, here you see someone walking down one of the sets of stairs. Uh, we don't wait for them to fall over, of course. We do biomechanical modeling. Uh, there are markers all over the person and the stairs to see how close they get um, to the... Uh, point of instability. Um, and it's actually British researchers that showed that by lengthening the going, lengthening the depth of the step um, from about 8 inches to over 11 inches, you can um, reduce by a factor of 4 the uh, serious accidents and fatalities um, experienced by people on stairs, which are really quite, quite numerous. Um, but we've had to demonstrate this in uh, research uh, in the research laboratory in order to convince the Canada Building Code to be changed. So that's the sort of thing that happens in Stair Lab. We develop these um, biomechanical models. 
let's go and look at um, simulator number six. Now, you saw briefly that, that our, some of our simulators can be um, lifted onto a motion base um, using a big crane. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, this simulator here is shown sitting on the floor in the um, in what level B2 we call it. It's about four stories below ground in the middle of Toronto. Um, and in this simulator we reproduce winter. So yeah, winter's not so important in Sheffield, I know, unless you go up on top of the Pennines. Winter in Canada is particularly important. Um, about 120 days on average of snow and ice coverage. We live in a rather ex a country of rather extreme um, climates. And so for two or three months in the year, um, our elderly people are often um, uh, isolated in their homes. They're in fear uh, in case if they walk outside, um, they'll fall and break a hip. They're frightened. Um, uh, so they become... Um, weaker, they lose their balance, they become isolated and disoriented. All of us though, all of us are at risk. We have five or six times the number of people in emergency departments on cold icy days. Um, primarily, not solely, but primarily because of slips and falls. So in Winter Lab, we're able to reproduce, oh this is not Winter Lab, this is another of our simulators, but nevertheless it, it does all environments. We're able to reproduce winter environments um, such as ice. Here you see someone walking on an icy slope. The slope, by the way, is only two degrees. And this person is wearing, wearing shoes, boots that are advertised for going to the Arctic. Very expensive boots, uh, which we're told are absolutely the best in winter. Very aggressive tread, bright colors, quite expensive. And you can see uh, that even on a one or two degree slope, uh, you slip sideways. So for Canadian and many American um, uh, consumers, this is a problem. You can go out and buy terrific looking boots that are advertised to do the job, but in fact don't do it. And you can't tell by looking at the boot how well they're going to do. So we're faced with two problems. We'd like to produce better labeling for consumers, and we'd also very much like to produce better boots so that we can walk around in confidence in the winter and shoes. So, so I'm going to start up the motion base. Here you go, we've gone back to the simulator and this time winter has been loaded onto a motion base and Susan is causing it to move. and is creating a hill. And here you see some results. The only reason for showing you these results is that in this natural walking environment, it's surprising how consistent the results are. Um, when we walk up and down slopes, um, we have very little variability and very easy to distinguish between the performance of different types of shoes and boots. In this picture you see um, a boot that's able to easily um, cope with more than 15 degree slopes, um, a rather special boot compared to good boots that you can buy on the market that are performing at about 5 degrees. That's the difference, that's from level to 20 degrees, it's quite a slope. So here we have, um, I'm going to show you just how interesting a very simple project can be. Here's boot number one, walking on dry ice. Uh, that's before I had my injury, walking up and down. Um, and now you see it five degrees, um, no particular problem. The robot is following me above my head to make sure I don't come to any harm. Seven degrees, I'm starting to have real, real difficulty. It looks as though seven degrees on dry ice is the limit um, for this boot. Now unfortunately winter we have lots of variable conditions so let's see what happens if we now go and put wet the ice. I'm going to just use a mop. 
I tell you, it's good. It's it's tough to get good help where I am. So I get the wet mop, mop the floor, um, just to make the ice wet. And now, in one degree, I can cope. But instead of the seven degrees, you'll see with wet ice, um, I just get a little bit of water on it, and at two degrees, I can't walk. Well, I can just, but it's very, very unsafe. Okay. So now let's look at boot number two. Boot number two, here I am on dry ice, by the way, has no tread at all. Has a particular material on the bottom of it. Um, looks very ordinary. I'm going up and down 13 degrees of dry ice. 15 degrees. By the way, what's strange with boot number two, I've cut it out for time, but if we wet the surface with boot number two, I can even cope with steeper surfaces in this case. I can go up 20 degrees. 19 anyway, um, but 20 sometimes. Big differences. And now, here's what makes it so difficult. Instead of the 15 degrees, now what I've done is I've got a smattering of snow. You can see just a, a little bit of powder on the floor. I can't even make 13 degrees. Tiniest amount of powder. 10 degrees. 8 degrees. Maybe, oh no, can't do that. 6 degrees. Less than half the slope with a tiny dusting of powder on the dry ice. So that, as with all so-called simple problems, um, there's a lot of depth to this. There's a lot. Uh, so it's really a very interesting area. And imagine if we can succeed in coming up with boots that instead of failing at one or two degrees, will be able to confidently walk on surfaces, whether they be wet or whether they be snow, snow have some snow sprinkled across them at um, maybe 10, 15 degrees or above. Make a huge difference to living here. Okay, so I've got to move on quickly um, to, to Richard's request for giving two examples of how we work. We have nine teams of researchers um, in areas ranging from AI and robotics through communications, through um, uh, through mobility, uh, spinal cord injury, neural, neural engineering and therapeutics. About 200 graduate students doing their, um, about 100 of them doing their PhDs, a bit more than half doing their PhDs. It's over 40 postdoctoral fellows now. So we've grown quite quickly in, in 10 years from almost uh, nothing to being quite a, quite a large group everyone working together um, and we work together to identify big problems. We have a, a culture where we focus on big problems. Um, not only do they have to be big problems, they have to, we have to see an opportunity to do something about them. We're not just going to sit there and bash our heads against the wall. So we need to see some opportunity to do something about the problem. And then, of course, we have to have the capacity to do it. And sometimes we have to wait in order to build that capacity. The next thing we do, I suppose, fairly straightforward, is we actually solve the problem. But we, we try to do it um, not just in a methodo me methodological sort of approach. Um, we try to do it creatively, with, cr with, with creativity. We, 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 we go on the wild side. We try crazy things. We then explore them iteratively with consumers, with caregivers, as we refine them until they are indeed a practical solution. And then we test that solution rigorously and publish it, the results in scientific journals. We don't stop. We take knowledge translation very seriously. We introduce either new best practices with um, guidelines into our clinics, or we change policies, or we change building codes or design guidelines, or we produce products, and we launch quite a, lot, quite a few um, new uh, spin-off companies. 
Two, I, two examples, real quick examples. A big problem. In North America, about a thousand people a week are killed because of poor hand hygiene in institutions. That's two jumbo jetfuls. Around the world, if you extrapolate it, 60 jumbo jetfuls of people killed every week because of this poor hand hygiene problem. You'd have thought it would have been solved since the mid-1800s when Semmelweis in Vienna um, discovered that physicians were causing um, up to a third of the patients going into an obstetric unit to die um, from infection. Um, whereas the, uh, the unit run by uh, midwives had nothing like that death rate. Um, he persuaded them to wash their hands in a, in, in, um, in a, a lime solution um, and the death rate dropped right off. Um, we've not seen that um, su success um, reproduced uh, completely. We're seeing there are still a large number of cases where people are dying from infection. So one of our areas of exploration has been to use badges such as this prototype you see here um, that know where you are, know whether you've washed your hands. When you wash your hands they glow green but they remind you, they vibrate when you need to wash your hands. Typically we've, we've done a big study now with detectors above the doors um, with emitters above the hand wash machines um, that you can imagine um, cause you to cause the badge to vibrate to prompt you to wash your hands um, and acknowledge when you wash your hands. We're now expanding these trials because of the rigorous uh, side of, of the testing to be able to we, we've now got kits that allow us to convert um, almost any kind of uh, wall alcohol gel or soap dispenser and um, and we've de developed smaller and smaller badges um, to see how we can w whether we can be successful in routine use um, here you see we have a detector over every doorway um, and a hand hygiene dispenser nearby this is the detector it's now a fan system it Gives, it gives out a fan of infrared light. We're about to um, do another test where we're going to be fitting out seven over 700 um, soap and alcohol gel dispensers in a variety of departments. So far we've shown that with the reminding part working we more than double hand hygiene. Um, if we just have the auditing part working we've just demonstrated that it's not effective. Um, in one unit that we put it in, it made no difference. So the reminding part, the encouraging part, is seems to be the key to this. Quickly, let's move on to my second example, sleep apnea. The problem, 8 to 10% of the population um, have sleep apnea. It's easily treatable, but only 1 in 10 of those people are diagnosed. And the consequences of not being diagnosed are massive. Three times heart attacks, four times strokes, two to 30 times motor vehicle accidents, depending on your severity, two times on average the health care cost. So why is this? This was the problem. The reason only one in 10 are diagnosed is you have to go to a sleep clinic and have all of these electrodes applied to you. We've replaced that with a simple microphone system that records your breathing at night. Um, it's a product now, a very low cost product. It's going through its testing. Um, the tests that we've published in the scientific literature show a very high correlation, show 95%, 96% correlation now. Um, but they also show that actually there's a variability between nights. And that if you use the device in a sleep clinic and then take it home afterwards, um, the, the sleep apnea tends to decrease at home. So we may be, with traditional methods, overestimating sleep apnea in some people coming into clinics. Well, 29 minutes and 41 seconds later, we've reached the end of this talk. I know I've glossed over things pretty quickly. Um, I'd love to see you here. I will come to see you in, um, 
in Sheffield as soon as I'm well. I know I'm supposed to be over in January, but I'll be over a, a couple of times next year. Um, thank you for listening to me. If there are opportunities to feed questions to me, I'll be pleased to, to take them. In the meantime, I'll sign off because I notice that my pet bird has started squawking in the background. You take care. Goodbye. <laughs>